Hello and welcome back to another semester of Mason Sports Insider. Happy 2016. I'm Tyler Byram with Dan Ward. We have a lot to talk about today. In fact, so much that we can't have it all in a single episode that we have to split up into two. And also, we're trying things a little bit different. Uh, we don't like rectangles, so we're going to circles. And there's a couple new things that we hope you guys will enjoy as well. So, how was your break, Dan? Starting off, first off. It's a quality break. You know, it's good to be back, though. It's good to be back in action in the swing of things for all what college life has to offer. Back to be good to be back here at Mesa Sports Insider, despite all the, you know, table changes that we've been having here. But good to be back. What about you, Tyler? Yeah, I'm doing quite well as well. Uh, busy semester it will be, and especially here on Mesa Sports Insider with the, all the additions that we have. Uh, just so you guys know, Dan is not a fan of change. So this don't. Don't have high hopes for Dan for this episode. Anyways, let's get started with the men's basketball team. So, over winter break, the men's basketball team had kind of a mixed results, is the easy way to put it. Uh, they won a majority of their out-of-conference games, but in-conference play started, and that is where Mason struggled mightily. They had games against Longwood and Wagner right after the semester, and in which they won easy games over lackluster schools, and then they jumped right into things against our bitter rivals of VCU, in which VCU came out and dominated from the tip. Yeah, that wasn't a very fun game to be getting the score updates on. Uh, they really just were outplayed and outmanned. That was one of the few games this season where we really saw how this team is still re is rebuilding and that it's a freshman-led team for the most part because m the majority of these games, they haven't had one of those games where the freshmen struggle to score and then the team struggles on defense, but this time it just seemed like it was a new team bunch of guys thrown out there, which in a sense it kind of is, but that game just, we'll just wipe that one off the table. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not important. It's the one that you can just kind of keep off to the side. And at the time, if you think about it on the timeline for Mason fans, I mean, a lot of fans were actually disheartened. I mean, VCU, they also brought in a new coach, a uh, battle mm -hmm. of new co coaches, as some people are putting it, as they have Will Wade now at the helm. Shaka Smart said bye-bye, and he's at Texas right now. Um, but a lot of people were, had high hopes for Mason, maybe not to win, but at least keep it close to find out where we were. And with that being the first game of conference play, it kind of turned some fans off. But they followed it up with good games. Still losses, though, uh, against St. Bonaventure. And then a game against Davidson that Mason was actually, like, this close to winning. I mean, that's the trend yeah. of Davidson. Ever since they've come <laughs> into the A-10, too, it's always been right there for Mason. And then Davidson pulls it out every time. A loss against St. Joseph's right after that, which actually St. Joseph's turned out to be a surprise team, along with St. Bonaventure mm -hmm. in the Atlantic 10. And then the team finally got a win against St. Louis. Yes, that was a big win, 92 points, the most points they've scored all season. They really came out, just fired on all cylinders. Everybody looked great. Livingston and Grayer really dominated for the freshmen. Thompson showed up. Like, it really was just everyone played well that game, so it was great to see. And, that's, and it was good because it was right around the time when we're starting to come back to school and we're going to start getting energized again a couple days or weeks before, but uh, it re revamped the system, mm -hmm. made, you, made you have a little bit more confidence and took away from those losses because they were close losses mm -hmm. other than the VCU game. But now it's a big win, big yes. win over St. Louis, big win over a team that we should be, and they did. Maybe we do have some hope for this season. Maybe we can actually make a little run here. Yeah. Well, then after that, the team actually headed to Fordham, in which the team lost. I know a lot of people are using Fordham as a measuring stick. Fordham is a very, is, I won't say a very good team. They are a better team than they have been in years past. They aren't your older brother's Fordham team, or I could even say grandfather's Fordham team. Um, lost against Fordham, lost against Duquesne at home. But I would say even though they are, one, at this point, we, have, we aren't talking about the GW game yet. That's coming mm -hmm. up. At this point, they were 1-6 in, in conference play. And I know one in six, you're like, ooh, that's rough, rough first half to start of the season. But actually, it's not that bad, in my opinion. I mean, they, and these are top teams, teams leading the conference. Yeah, Davidson has been great since they've joined the A-10, and even before. One but conference championship last year. Exactly. Um, VCU, always a tough opponent. It doesn't matter that Smart's gone. A lot of players come back, and their, their assistant coach, who is now the head coach, very intelligent and knows the system very well. And St. Joe's, as long as Phil Martell's there, I'm, I'm never knocking them down. <laughs> they will, they'll be a contender or at least a very good team every year. So the, the teams that they've played, yes, you're right. They've been one of the top teams. They've been playing a lot of top or tier teams in the A-10. They've had a little bit of a tougher schedule, one and six, as long as they were playing well. And that's what they've been doing. One and six doesn't look quite as bad. Uh, the, the rest of the season, that's mm -hmm. really what's important, the back half of the schedule. 
when they're playing some of the weaker opponents, how will they do? Yeah, and that's it, that's the point. Winning against St. Louis was actually a pivotal point because that's when you kind of saw things swing the other way on the pendulum. Mason was actually one of the toughest A-10 schedules in the conference. So it's kind of unfortunate when you're the bottom team last year and then have to go and beat the big boys again. Um, but enough about the schedule. Uh, Marquise Moore, he's been fantastic for the team thus far. Easily has to be the team MVP. I know a lot of people want to put it at Otis. But I mean, Marquise, he's leading the team in points. He's second on the team in rebounds, leading the team in assists, Le uh, leading the team in blocks, 22 blocks. That's more than Siobhan, which probably is surprising stat for a majority of you, and is second on the team in steals. I mean, he's been phenomenal. He has a completely changed player, especially since he was freshman year. And now he's kind of taken on that leadership role on the team, and he is playing like he's the guy with the most experience on the court. Mm -hmm. You've seen it ever since his freshman year. He's just been getting better and better. He came in as a freshman, took the leadership role as one of the starting point guards, one of the guards, or the sixth man off the bench, depending on the game. But he came in, and every year you've seen him getting better. His shot's been so much better. If you look at his <laughs> freshman year shot compared to this year, well, his, the form is so much nicer. And then his strength is up. His jumping ability, despite being like middle of the pack as far as height goes, like you said, leading the team in blocks, he plays hard, he knows the t system, he recognizes when he has to score, when he has to take over the game. He's been doing a great job this year. MVP, definitely in my, in my book. Well, even you say his shouting's improved his, what his, what's it called? When you shoot, I mean, that's just, mm, not many people are a fan of his uh, oh, yeah. motion. The, the form, the, the form, form that's the word shot. I'm looking for. But com comparing it this year, it's still like a little not, nice to look at it's not very nice and to the eye but compared to freshman year he's improved vastly and you see it in his points per game 12.4 he's always been able to give out assists his rebounds are up but his points per game he's recognizing he can score and now that he has a little bit of an outside shot 15 footer a little bit of a threat from outside that opens up his drive even more and he can dominate down low okay now let's take digest everything that we just said and head to a game against the colonials revolutionary rivalry huge matchup Fairfax turned out 5,168 people in attendance, largest home crowd of the season, almost half of a sellout, uh, which I say is improvement for a rebuilding year. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Um, also, GW, thank you for your fans coming. I mean, that helps us get some money on our end. But great game. Both of you and I were there, and that was probably, that's the, on my list of Mason games I've been to, that's number two. And you know what was number one? Back my freshman year, 2012, when Mason beat UVA on the home opener. I don't know if any game will ever beat that for me, but that just shows how long it's been to have a game of that magnitude mean that much and be so much fun to be a part of. Without a doubt. The team, the team or not the, not the team, but the arena has had some sh troubles getting people in. And to see that many fans come out to the game, yes, it wasn't a sellout. It was only half the, the capacity. But then again, Eagle Bank Arena is huge. Mm -hmm. It's one of the biggest uh, stadiums in the A-10, if not the biggest as far as seat capacity. So... 5,000 fans, fantastic, and there were just times in that game where it was surreal of how mm -hmm. loud it was and how the fans just all came together, whether it was cheering for the team, whether it was booing the refs, whether it was singing, living on a prayer together, whatever it was, it was really a surreal moment, just kind of those times where you wanted to stop cheering just for a second, just so that you could like take it all in, and it was, it was pretty great. I really wish we could have gotten the win though with that type of a game and that type of a crowd because I don't want I don't want any of you guys watching to take the loss away from what the atmosphere and what the experience was like because that game was so much fun not only to watch but to just be a part of and to have that community with the fellow college students as well as the alumni and company it was fantastic. Yeah, I honestly could not describe the game any better than you just did right there. It was phenomenal. Fantastic. Let's actually go into the particulars of the game, but before we start, I mean, my favorite moment was actually Doc Nix going up into the stands with like five minutes left to go and telling everyone to stand up. Mm -hmm. Probably not a better moment than that. But in the game, Mason actually kept it close and held the lead. Um, from the tip, it was close. I mean, neither team really went on runs until later on, and both teams were able to come back. Mason actually led at halftime 31-29. to 29. Um, and, But then in the second half, Mason opening three, I believe it was... Uh, Jair Gray, I want to say it was Gray that had that opening three to start the second half. And then GW, 13-0 run. And just kind of killed the momentum a little bit. Mason came back. Eventually, GW, though, on top by 10 points, looking to run away with it near the end of the contest. Mason, though, kept chipping away, mm -hmm. chipping away. 
That's, that's the type of team that George Washington is, though. They are good enough where they can go on those big runs, and as an opponent, you have to be able to sustain that run and try and come back from it. And the Patriots were able to do that for mm -hmm. the most part. As you said, they came back from that 13-0 deficit. You thought, oh, no, the game. We played so well for 25 minutes, but if this is a 40-minute game, the game's running out from us. But then they came back, uh, again, led probably by Otis Livingston. He's really been phenomenal, and he took that game into his own hand. Shagger Greer, I believe, was held scoreless at halftime, then knocked in at three or four threes. So that was great to see him pick up his shooting effort. That was a great job. They battled hard. There's not much more you can ask for. And Coach Paulson said at the beginning of the season, we may not win a lot of games, but we're not going to give up on any games, and we're going to be fighting every game. And that's what they did against George Washington. Yeah, definitely did. You mentioned Otis Livingston. He had 18 points in the contest, along with seven assists. One of them being an assist to tie the game up at 59. Take a look here. Driving down the court, transition opportunity, behind the back pass to DeAndre Abram. The stadium was electric at that point. I know I was jumping off the seat, and I'm sure Mason Athletics, mm -hmm. they had a camera guy on me. And I'm sure there's going to be some beautiful shots of me <laughs> later on coming out this week. Um, but it was just, it was so much fun. Uh, Siobhan Thompson, he added 12 rebounds. Uh, Marco Gonicic actually got the start, which is big ever since his... Uh, suspension since coming mm -hmm. back. This is his first start since then. DeAndre a Abram added nine points. Marquise Moore was the only other player in double digits with ten. But GW, they had four guys in double digits being led by Patricio Garnillo, who just killed us at the line down the stretch. Nine from eleven. And yeah. 30 points off foul shots by George Washington. I know about ten of them or so were at the end of the mm -hmm. game when Mason was forced to foul, but give them credit. They made 30 out of 36 of their foul shots. That's a heck of a foul shooting percentage, 83% for the game. And that's really kind of what did it in for them, is that they were able to make their foul shots. Uh, Garino, great job from the floor, three for three from three. Ooh, that's a lot of threes. <laughs> but he, he did a great job. And that's, again, George Washington, that's why they are one of the top teams in the conference. That's why they're battling so well. That's why they're able to come out and compete against some of the nationally ranked teams in the out-of-conference play. They have a, plan, a wide variety of scores. They have the confidence in that anybody can show up and take, take that uh, lead step. The guy that I was looking at was Larson, who did have a double-double, 10 and 11. But he was, it was like a quiet double-double. Double. But then the other guy stepped up. Yeah, Larson was easy to pick on in the first half from the student section, I would say. But then when you look at his stat line at the end, you're just kind of like, how did that happen? But you mentioned George Washington being one of the top teams in the conference. Let's use that as a perfect segue to our Atlantic 10 Conference standings presented to you by Giant Killer. So when you look at it, VCU still undefeated. I don't understand how you can be in the Atlantic 10 Conference and still be undefeated. But VCU is. They're 8-0. Fantastic for them. New coach. Just can't say enough about them. I know it stinks being a Mason fan team VCU at the top. But we got to live with it. Uh, Dayton, they're doing their thing 8-1. and one. We mentioned St. Joseph's and St. Bonaventure. They're having great years. Um, but you see those top guys starting to separate themselves from the pack, and it'll be a real battle for that four seed to get that double buy in the A-10 tournament. Yeah, without a doubt. VCU is a surprise. I knew I expected them to play well, but new coach, a new system, and I expected yeah, I them to be undefeated well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in the middle of the pack, it, it is. It's a very clustered middle of the pack. Duquesne, Davidson, Rhode Island, all right there, 5-4, four, 4-4. Four four. Um, Mason... We don't, not, not expected to jump into that middle of the pack, but hey, if they can run off six of their next seven, you know, get to 500, that'd be huge. That's a, maybe high expectations, but not necessarily un, unmatchable expectations. Yeah, well, one game away from the midpoint of Atlantic 10 play. Mason, as we mentioned, tough opening half of the schedule. A couple games going forward. They have a chance if you, to actually jump up. If they were to win out, they could pass Duquesne which I don't think is going to happen, but it's still plausible, and I'm sure everyone in your heads, that's what you're seeing. Um, but it's very feasible to at least still go up and pass Fordham and St. Louis being there at 3-6. and six. No doubt. Odds may not be in our favor, but certainly a possibility for them. Right. So that'll wrap things up for the men's team. Let's head over to the women's team, who over the break kind of had a back-and-forth mix. They would win a game, then they'd lose a game, then they'd win a game. They, had, they kind of had a struggle there for a little bit to get back-to-back -back wins. They eventually did it a couple times, but the biggest win was a win over St. Louis to open up conference play. They won 73-63 to in overtime, and if you look at the standings now, St. Louis only has one loss, and that's to yes, the George Mason Patriots. So that is huge for the team. They then would go on 
to kind of, again, go back and forth. They had a tough road trip in New York where they lost to both Fordham and St. Bonaventure. Then they came back, beat VCU, which was great and a big home win, beat them by double digits. So at least the women's side is able to beat up on VCU. Then they've had a couple of tough games. They played GW very, very well. GW undefeated still in A-10 play. So that was a huge game for the team. Although they didn't win, they played very strong, and that's what they've been doing all season long. They've been growing, and they've been playing better. Their most recent game was a win against UMass. Kristen McCube led the way with a double-double and 15 rebounds, career high. So they are back on their winning ways as they're going to head over to Davidson next. But you've seen that this team has grown considerably from the start of the season, and I think the conference schedule has really helped them out. Yeah, this most recent game against the University of Massachusetts, you mentioned they won 64-59. Um, a game that Mason, it honestly probably should have been more, to be honest. I mean, uh, University of Massachusetts, don't want to take any credit away from them. They're at the bottom of the conference. Mason, they're looking to battle on that mid-pack, which they are doing right now. Um, but, Dan, you were at that game. I mean, what, what was going on with the team? It, the biggest thing was just the lack of offense uh, at the end of the game. At the end of the game, they didn't have that finishing move, that, if you want to say, in which you are at the top and then you just put away a team. Instead, they allowed UMass to kind of stay in the game, make things interesting towards the end of the game, and they pulled away with the win. But 59 points, that's back-to-back -back games in which they've held teams under 60, and three out of the last four, they've held teams under 60, with the fourth one being George Washington. So their defense has really showed up huge recently, and defense wins games because they have a great offense, it's just sometimes it doesn't show up, but if their defense can be consistent, then they have a good chance at the rest of the season. Yep, that and, and at that game against UMass, three Patriots actually got double figures. Of course, Taylor Brown doing her thing. Kara Wright, you mentioned she, uh, you mentioned to me earlier, she's mm -hmm. second in the team in points scored, and she was one of the players that we saw at the beginning of the year that she's like, oh wow, this is a spark. This is this is a she is a. Uh, I, I, kind of a must-see player, if you will, if you're a fan of the women's basketball team. Yes, we know all about Taylor Brown. Everybody who's Downtown a Taylor Brown fan knows Taylor Brown and what she did last season, leading the A-10 with 20-plus points a game. This season, it's a little bit down. She's averaging 15 a game, but that's not necessarily due to her lack of ability to score or anything like that. Teams obviously know more about her, so their uh, film is more and their strategy is more based on her. So Kara Wright has actually been huge for this team. She's coming in first year for, with the team, redshirt junior, and has come in second on the team in scoring. And in A-10 play, she's really turned it up. We actually got to talk to her after the UMass game, and she said how her confidence has shot up since the start of A-10 play. Her teammates trust her to take shots. Coach Millison is super high on Kara Wright. She's going to have to be the leader next year once Brown graduates. So this season, they've really been focused a lot on her, and she's been able to take the, take the reins, really, and she's been dominating. She's first in free throw percentage, second on the team in scoring and assists and blocks, similar to Marquise yeah. Moore, despite being a guard, picking up those blocks, and then fourth in rebounds. So she really does it all, stat stuff for every game. Uh, she's, I can't, I wouldn't necessarily say MVP of this team because it's, it's tough to really put an MVP on this team mm -hmm. because of the wide variety and of people who contribute, but definitely one of the top players on this team and one of the reasons why they're playing pretty well right now. Yep, where we'll use that as another transition to go into stands. But real quick, also Taylor Brown scored her 1,500th point, is now fifth on the all-time scoring list for Mason's women basketball history. But looking at our giant killer Atlantic 10 standings, you mentioned St. Louis. Uh, now they have two losses, but they're one, uh, they were sitting at 7-1. and one. Their one loss earlier was to the George Mason Patriots. Yeah, that's my apologies. Then take a, another look at the standings. Uh, have to find out who that second loss was to. But... Uh, again, GW at the top, player of the year, potentially. John Quill Jones has been leading that team. She's been phenomenal. But if you look at Mason, currently 10th, but tied for 7th with VCU, Dane, and St. Joe's, 4-5. and five. And that 4-5 and five is, again, two games against St. Louis at the top of the pack. One game against George Washington, one game against St. Bonaventure, one game against Duquesne, one game against Fordham. So, what's that? Games Most, coming. Mostly half of it, more than half of their games have been against the top seven teams in the conference right now. So the back half of their schedule, they feel really confident in their ability to win six out of seven, five out of seven. And then that would rise them up to that middle of the pack, five, six seed maybe. Then you get an easier game for that first round of the tournament. Maybe there's an upset. You get an easier game second round. Who knows where they go? If they can make semifinals uh, of the 8 10 championship with a, what would it be, 10 and six record or something like that, WNIT isn't out of the picture. Yeah, anything can happen with this team. I mean, and why not be confident with what's going forward and what they've already done at this point in the year? All right, 
Now let's head to another team that's looking to be confident in the next coming weeks, the George Mason men's and women's swimming and diving teams. They're wrapping up their regular season schedule. I actually done all they have left is the Atlantic 10 championships. Open winter break, they headed to the Orange Bowl Classic down in Miami, Florida. Men's team finishes third out of four teams, women team second out of five teams. Sydney Fisher at the event, she took two podium finishes, first in the 50-yard butterfly and third in the 100-yard butterfly. And two podium finishes in a meet like this where there are five different teams, that's pretty big. I mean, I don't, if you're not a swimming and diving fan, I mean, that, that's taking a lot and putting a lot on your shoulders. And we have more to talk about Sydney Fisher coming up forward. Later on, after Orange Bowl, they swept the George Washington Colonials, both the men's and the women's team. The men won 13 out of 14 events. That's incredible. I mean, it, nearly as good as it gets. Yeah, I mean, you can't. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, women team, they won 10 out of 14, which would be just as impressive if the men team men didn't win 13. Well. Yeah, I know. Just yep. congrats to the men's team. Again, Sydney Fisher, that time she won three events, 50 freestyle, 100-yard butterfly, and the 400-yard medley relay. She was part of that team that won that event. And then most recently this past weekend, they also had an event canceled and postponed because of the snow, snowmageddon, whatever you want to call it. Um, men's team beat American. Women's team beat American, but they both lost to Army in that match. Well, it's a shame to get a sweep uh, mm -hmm. after sweeping George Washington getting swept by Army, but this team, if you go back to our earlier episodes back in 2015, we've talked about some of these names, especially Sydney Fisher for the women's team. The swimming and diving team has a lot of potential and they've proven it over the winter break. Uh, they continue to win and continue to get podium finishes. Even if the team doesn't have success, their individuals are having tremendous success this season. Yes, they are. And just going forward, we mentioned all that's left is Atlantic 10 play. Um, that's on the 17th and 20th. So far on the season, the men are 3-0 and against Atlantic 10 opponents. Again, three teams that they should beat. Davidson, who was preseason ranked 5th. LaSalle, preseason ranked 4th. GW, preseason ranked 7th. Mason was preseason ranked, I believe, 3rd. Yeah, they were ranked 3rd to start the year. Um, women's team, they've been impressive, though. They're three and one. Lone loss to Richmond, who's expected to win the championships, which they did last year. But they had a win against the the five, seven, and nine teams, and the same that Mason beat, uh, the men's team beat, Davidson, LaSalle, and George Washington. Beating the teams that you're supposed to beat. That's always that's always a key to successful teams. Beat those that you're supposed to beat. <clears throat> Pardon me. And now they'll have, as you said, the A10 championships coming up. They should feel confident, especially mm -hmm. with the way they've swam recently and they've been winning some key matches. If they can uh, get on a little bit of a roll here, I don't see why they can't make a run at Richmond, at least from the women's side, and why the men can't do the same thing on their side. Yeah, I've mentioned this before. The George Mason swimming and diving team always been a huge part of the athletic program here. They're looking to kind of build that back up, especially now that they've gone to the Atlantic 10, kind of figured out how what they have to live up to now. And they're doing quite well here in, what is it, third season in the Atlanta. Moving on now, the wrestling team. How about those guys? They, they uh, had, a, had a little bit of up and down as well in, over the break. They were doing very well once as soon as we left. They had three straight wins as a team. And then they went on to the Virginia Duels, where they struggled a little bit, ended up taking the first place bronze um, after went, losing the first two rounds and then winning the last two matches that they had. So a little bit of an up and down season. They have played some of the better teams. Uh, they're only one and three in the conference, but there's still lots of matches to go on. Uh, but there has been some very strong individual play, and that's what I would like to see, especially in wrestling, because as much of a team sport as it is, it really comes down to the individuals, and you can see individuals go far, even on a bad team. So some of those guys that, I just, that we should point out who continued their success, uh, Greg Flournoy, first of all, the redshirt senior, 23 and seven record this uh, year, this season, he has, Three straight wins, I believe. Um, he's wrestling at 157. He's having a phenomenal se season, as well as Vince Rodriguez, 19 and seven at 133. And then Matthew Voss has been doing a pretty good job at the heavyweight position. Um, he's only a redshirt freshman, 18 and 13. Struggled his last couple matches, got beat, but doing a phenomenal job. A lot of these individual players. Yeah, the team overall, they're six and eight overall, one and three in the EWL. But as you mentioned, this is kind of one of those individually based sports. I mean, it's great to win as a team and EWL championship. That's great to win as a team. But all that matters is going to the NCAA tournament as an individual. Exactly. And performing well. Greg Flournoy, he's looking to do that after his run last year. Vince Rodriguez, he's looking 
quite well can be another one can do that. And, and why not give a shout out to Matt Voss, the yeah. redshirted freshman? He's exactly. talking very well. He had a huge role to fill with Jake Kettler, who graduated. So, I mean, just Voss, he's doing well. They face Navy in Annapolis this upcoming Wednesday and then face the EWL rival in Bloomsburg. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. I'm sorry, we only went through four sports, and I know there's probably, what, I don't even know. We have 22 sports here at Mason. Um, but here's some other scores that happened this week so that you are still updated. We'll bring up everything back up to date later in the week, uh, next week. Women's tennis team, they defeated Mount St. Mary 7 to nothing after losing to Towson 6 to 1. And the track and field, they also hosted Patriot Games this past weekend, encouraging results for the team there at that meet. The men's volleyball team, after a rough road trip, they came back home. They faced IPFW, in which they lost in a three-set sweep. And then they eventually went on to beat, uh, excuse me, they almost beat Ball mm -hmm. State, but then lost 3-2. to two. Well, I put my hands in my yeah. face because that game was right there. Yeah. They're so close and would have been a huge win for the team. Mm -hmm. Would have been a huge weed win for the team, definitely. But let's go ahead and talk about our upcoming schedule for this week, a busy, busy week. For the athletics program. Yeah, where should we start? Wednesday, there's three different things going on between the women's basketball team going traveling to Davidson and the men's team traveling to Richmond while wrestling takes on Navy. A lot of action on Wednesday to start things off. Yep, track and field. They head up to Boston. They have two meets, Crips and Elite, as well as the Scarlet and White Invitational. Men's women's tennis teams, they're right in the thick of things going quite well. And the men's volleyball team, they have another double homestand. They're playing two Commerce Carolina opponents in Pfeiffer and Limestone. So make sure you head to the rack for those games. And Super Bowl Sunday, come on out in the afternoon to watch the women's basketball team play St. Joe's. you got plenty of time. It's an afternoon game, so you can watch some good basketball, and then you can go cheer on for the Panthers. Yeah, and then you can go get some... Oh, Panthers. Oh, boy. Oh, you just had to... You had to finish the show talking about Pam Newton. But anyways, that's all we got for you. This week, we hope we see you guys next week. We'll bring you up today on all the other sports. Sorry we couldn't get to it today. Make sure you check out our graphic and medium provider and Giant Killer at their website, giantkiller.co. Man, it was a busy start to start the semester. Yeah, well, oof, we gotta take a break. We'll, yeah. Luckily, we have seven days until we'll be back at this. So yeah, it's, we'll it's, be able to recap and get our yeah. get our gears back. Well, like I said, that's all we got. Until next time, I'm Tyler Byram. This is Dan Ward, and we'll see you guys next week.